All right, I think it's that time. Again, thank you everybody for attending tonight. I really appreciate it. We've got Kip Carpenter on tonight. Um, you know, Kip, I was just, and before we get rolling right into everything, I was just looking back at um, old webinars that we've done. It is almost to the month. As of next month, we've been doing webinars with Kip Carpenter for exactly a year. So, <laughs> happy wow. anniversary, Kip Carpenter. <laughs> wow, it doesn't I mean, seem like it. Crazy, yep, September 2015. So, um, I think that's kind of an awesome opportunity for us to look back on some of the questions that may or may not have either been answered or that everybody seems to ask, so we want to delve in a little bit deeper. Um, and that's what we're going to do here tonight. So any anybody who's listening tonight, if you do have, I've seen a couple people um, pop in with some questions. That is great. I will take a look at them um, and get them to the top of the list as well. Um, so let's, without further ado, I don't want to waste too too much time. Um, actually, you know what? While we're while we're kind of getting rolling here, if you have not been to one of our webinars, if this is your very first webinar with us, would you go into the questions section and let me know that? Um, and that way, I know how much of this type of introduction stuff I need to do. Um, if this is your very, very first webinar, go to the dashboard section of GoToWebinar, type in your questions area. Hey, this is my first time. Awesome. Thank you for joining us, Brendan. Um, and let me know, uh, and, and we'll kind of walk through. Great. Looks like we have uh, a couple first timers here. Welcome, welcome. So I will go through a couple of these things with everybody. Um, we always kind of start out with who we are and what we do and why we do what we do here. Um, at SDI, we are uh, a nationally accredited online firearms technology program, um, and actually we have multiple programs. We have a full associate degree, and that's an associate of science in firearms technology. Um, we have an advanced gunsmithing certificate program, a ballistics and reloading certificate course, AR-15, AR-10, 1911 advanced armor courses. Those armor courses you can actually take as a standalone or as part of the associate degree or the advanced gunsmithing certificate program, either or. So if you want to just do one of the armorers courses, totally fine. Um, but they do give you that option as part of your uh, part of one of the larger two credentials as well. Um, and those two, speaking of those two, associate of science and firearms technology degree and advanced gunsmithing certificate are both approved for use of most TA and VA benefits. So if you do have any military benefits that you're interested in using, please let us know. We're happy to walk you through that. Um, almost 80% of our student body is either former or active duty military. We're very proud of that. Um, we love serving our military students, and we also love serving our non-military students. So if you are non-military, no benefits, military and no benefits, whatever the case may be, we do offer payment plans if that makes it easier for you, um, and we do stuff on a case-by-case -case basis. You know, we, we reap the benefits of being a large small school <laughs> so we we like a lot of one-on-one -on -one stuff um, and make sure that we kind of know where our students are at any given time so um, quick note as well the Associate of Science in Firearms Technology degree program is also approved um, to take part in the Title IV Federal Student Aid program um, everything all of these programs all of these funding programs are based on a based on individual eligibility. So if you are eligible for benefits, we are available to accept them. If that is weird or, or confusing to you, our admissions team is awesome. Our financial services team is awesome. They're more than happy to help walk you through that, that type of thing. Um, there's one thing at the bottom there and uh, it talks about field studies. And I did want to take just a quick, um, quick little sidetrack here on field studies. These are really cool externships that are available for students within those first two programs that are listed there, Associate of Science and Advanced Gunsmithing Certificate. Um, if you're a stu current student in one of those two programs, you are eligible to apply for a field study. It's a two to four week on-site hands-on training opportunity at no cost to the student except for travel and lodging. So you have to get yourself there and you have to be able to live there for two to four weeks. Um, if that is something that you apply for and are accepted for, um, like I said, no additional cost to the student, and I cannot express enough how amazing these opportunities are. We've had um, the students that we've had go through these field studies have just love, love, loved them, and we've got a really cool one that we just um, that we just kind of got on the books here. I can we'll be talking about it very soon, but it's a major, major company in the industry. We're super excited about it. Keep an eye out over the next probably maybe even next week, um, but for sure within the next two weeks you'll be hearing a lot about that. 
if you have any questions, yeah, I know, I'm so excited, right? Um, <laughs> if you have any questions about the school, feel free to email admissions at sdi.edu. Um, I think, did I put that on here? I did not, okay. Um, admissions at sdi.edu, or if you want to email me, I'd, I'd be happy to play triage, you know, and get you to the right people. Um, my email address is jennifer, J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R, at sdi.edu, sierradeltaindia.edu. Um, let us know if we can help you with anything. And um, a lot of you guys are already current students or already through the application process. Um, you already know, you know, go to your student services op um, rep, go to your admissions rep. All of us are happy to help. We're all part of one big team here. So, all right. So, Kip, um, I'm going to pass the baton over to you. Although I will just take the opportunity here to say that since we did our last webinar together, um, Kip has been honored with a, kind of a promotion of sorts to lead instructor for SDI. There are only two of them. Um, Kip is one of them, um, and 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 rightfully so. You know, that's that's something that I think a lot of people agreed was the right thing to do. We get glowing remarks from. From Kip, and if anybody is a Kip student right now, um, chime in and let me know. But Kip, I'll let you talk about your background and credentials. Is that okay? Sure. Okay, cool. Well, it, it's like you have on there. Um, I, I, everyone wants to know how I got started, and to run down the story just very quickly, uh, and we have it in several of our webinars. Uh, when I was just a teenager, we had a family friend. He worked for American Wholesale. He was a master gunsmith. And when I say master, I mean true master. There wasn't nothing I think that man could not do with lathes, machinery, gunsmithing. He just had it all. And he and his son and I were best friends. And we both loved to shoot. My dad loved to shoot. So we all kind of hit it off. And he kind of taught me and his son several things. And, and one of the things we would do is sometimes this was when we were temporary, when we were living in California at the time, uh, you had to go out to the mountains or the hills to shoot. And we'd go to San Bernardino. And he'd say, okay, guys, you want to go shooting this week? Yeah, we want to go. And he would have some type of weapon. He said, well, we're going to go out and shoot these guns this week. And he'd give them to us in a box, torn down, and say, now put them back together. And by Saturday, we'll go shooting. And that's how it really all started. <laughs> and I, I became fascinated with it. I mean, I just, you know, I liked working with my hands anyway. I've been a marine mechanic. I've been other things with my hands. And guns was just always uh, something I really loved to do. And, of course, I had my dad's permission and, and, and as well. And it really started there. And I would say by the time we were 18, or I was anyway, probably knew as much as many gunsmiths in the areas that had their own shops. And it just kept growing from there. Back then, I wasn't aware of any kind of schooling for gunsmithing. And you either had to go through an apprenticeship with somebody who'd take you in or, or something of that nature. But one thing that I did was I would go to the libraries, and I'd get any book I could get. And I would read all these authors. Um, you know, back then, Outdoor Life was very prominent. used to have a book line. And you could get several things like that, um, how to uh, improve your stocks, glass bedding, uh, improvements for accuracy. And, man, I would just read those books. I just loved them. And that's really how it kicked off for me. It wasn't until later in life that I took some programs to uh, get certified. And I'll be honest with you. I was actually kind of disappointed. And a lot of people said, what do you mean? And I said, well, the, the, the courses I took, I learned some things, but it was all pretty much stuff I already, already had learned by uh, reading all these famous gunsmiths books. And then, uh, I guess it was over about two years now, I met Zeke. And Zeke is our chair. And Zeke said, well, we got this program, man. And I looked at SDI's program. And I went, whoa, this is, this is pretty good. And it wasn't, there was a lot of older things in there. And Paul and Zeke, and Paul is our, our, our I call him Grand Pooh Ball. He's our big boss. But he gave Zeke the green light, and they both worked very hard, and the faculty worked very hard that we have to really start improving things. And Zeke was uh, already in the, the uh, firearms field. He was one of the... Um, uh, the co-host was uh, Talking Lead, so he had lots of connections. And the next thing you know, 
he started bringing on everybody he could recruit. And the people he would recruit is all the people that, that most of you out there have seen on YouTubes and, and on television, and the list goes on. And some of, them, some of these people are even in our field study. Uh, the guys that were formerly of Red Jacket and became Atlas, uh, they took over the company, and, and you can do field studies with them, and several others, as Jennifer mentioned before. Um, you can see my credentials up there. I've, I've been a certified pistol smith, shotgun smith, rifle smith, rim fire smith, uh, block armors. I've uh, been to the Barrett School, have gotten all certifications in that, which, which was really a fun. I had a lot of fun there. And as well as I'm also a, an NRA certified instructor in metallic cartridge reloading, shotgun shell reloading, certified pistol and personal protection in the home. And I'm not the only one at SCI that has credentials out there, uh, we have a very unique faculty, and I'm going to touch on that real quick. Our faculty comes from all walks of life, both within the industry and out of the industry, to create a, a different kind of environment you will learn. And I, I cannot say enough for the school. Jennifer knows this about me. I tell everybody, and they say, why SDI? <laughs> and I say, why not? Why aren't you in SDI? <laughs> And, and that's pretty much how it goes. And, and uh, the Jennifer can tell you, we've had some really, really incredible, talented people here on the webinars. And I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about other people within the industry. We have experts that know everything about ATF laws. We have experts that know everything about FFLs. We have people who uh, also have gunsmithing backgrounds, military backgrounds, law enforcement backgrounds, legal backgrounds. I mean, there's just all kinds of walks of life here. And I think that's just going to uh, – Jennifer, you can tell them. How, how fast have we grown in the last year since I've been here? Exponentially. I mean, I, just the, the last five years has been huge growth in general. The last year has been great as well. It's just been – it's been so great to have all of the people involved that are currently involved. You know, that we took it from five years ago or four years ago – a distance education, um, you know, curriculum that hadn't really been updated in a while to what it is now, which I, I truly believe is one of the most cutting edge and, and up to date curriculums available currently. So we're super proud of everything that's happened in the last four years, of course, but even in the last year, just with the growth of curriculum and everything. So it's been really cool around here. Exactly, and, and it just keeps growing and growing and growing and growing. And I think it's just going to keep growing. I mean, it's just, I don't, I don't know where we're going to top out with this. And I can't speculate, but I can tell you that nobody is ever satisfied at SDI. From our curriculum department to Zeke to Paul to, to uh, uh, Sarah and Renee and all the other faculty we have here in Jennifer, there we all have expert skills. Just like Jennifer is an expert when it comes to, to the uh, uh, social media. And we're going to touch on that a little bit later, too, because we have some questions for her out of my bank as well. But but that's pretty much how I got into it and fell into it. And, you know, anything I've done, you guys can do and go beyond because they're giving you so much more than I ever had given to me. And I think that, that it's just going to get better and better and better. Now, can we guarantee that you're going to walk right out our doors and just be, you know, the next big thing? No, we can't. That's up to you. That's up to you to do that. But we can give you all of the tools that you need to go out there, get started, and make your mark in the world. We can do that, and we do do that. And we're striving every day to make it better and better and better. And I, I already think we're number one, but I think that you're going to find in the future that this school is going to get even more well-known, and it will be the industry standard as the number one out there. And I truly believe that. I believe that too. We're, it's it's been exciting around here, you know, like we said over the last couple of years, and particularly the last 12 months. So, only only way to go is up. Um, so let's go ahead and get rolling then. Um, and just so everybody knows, this is the same. You'll we're just going to kind of roll some pictures in the background and everything as we're talking. Um, I've had a, a bunch of questions come in, but what I think makes the most sense, Kip, is I've pulled a whole bunch of questions from the last, I don't know, four or five webinars that you and I have done over the, over the year. 
Um, and I'd like to start from the beginning. A, a lot of people say, um, how, do you, you know, how do you take that step to become a gunsmith? How do you get started? What should you have on hand? What kind of tools and materials? Licensing, et cetera. Can you give me, a, let's do a brief overview, and then I'll, I'll chime in with follow-up questions as well. Absolutely. The first thing, and those of you who are students, you've already taken the first step. You came to SCI to get your education. That's your first step. Once you go from there, you decide, okay, I'm ready. I'm going to go out there, and I want to hang my shingle. I want to do this. You can start in a garage. You can start anywhere that's a small area. That bit you see on that screen right there is how I first started in Tennessee when I opened my shingle. Three years after that picture was taken, I had the biggest full service shop in Middle Tennessee. Okay? You can do the same thing. That right there was just, okay, here's what we do. So the first thing that I did to, to get going was I knew I had to have an FFL. So I applied for my FFL. I heard all the horror stories. I heard all this and that. And the other. All I did was read the instructions on the FFL, and I did it. The first thing I did, and it said you have, they have to have proof, was I went down to my local county and city uh, business licensor, and I told them what I wanted to do, and could I have one at my house. Well, I lived in a small community, and lucky for me, they allow home businesses, but they never had anybody want one for gunsmithing. And they said, okay, you know what? We'll let you do this. The only stipulation is, you know, we don't want parking issues because you live in a neighborhood. And I said, that's no problem. They have appointment only. They said, great. So I got the city letter. They wrote me a letter saying that Kip is zoned in his area for that. So I had that. Went over to the county. And, and by the way, they gave me my license right then and there, too, once I had the letter. Then I went over to the county office. The county office said, okay, what is, uh, what do you want to do? And I told them. And I said, here, I have the letter from the city. They said, hey, we're good with that, too. I walked out of there with my county license. So I walk out. I go back home. I filled out the rest of the packet, had my fingerprints done, did everything just as the instructions say. I sent it all off with my fee, of course, because, you know, it ain't government that wants their money. So that three months later, okay, not quite three months, I find it takes a little time depending on how busy ATF is. Don't let that discourage you, okay? That's where a lot of people get discouraged. Does it mean you can't do anything? No. No, if you've got friends or family and you still want to practice while you're waiting on your license, you can do that. You just can't get paid. Okay? They can buy their parts, bring it to you, but you can still you can still get going. Okay? In the meantime, there's a bunch of other stuff to do too, and we're going to cover that in just a second. So the ATF contacted me. They sent out a field agent. He came and looked at my garage, the area I was at. He sat down at my table. He spent about two and a half, three hours with me explaining everything. And he had me sign some papers. And he said that it looked, everything looked great, that he was fine with what I was going to do, and he was going to send it back to the main office. And I forget exactly how long it took, but the FFL came in the mail. So you can imagine I was thrilled to death. So there, <laughs> so, um, I didn't have any of the, the headaches or heartaches that I heard about. Go ahead, Jennifer. We had a couple people uh, who it sounds like they're current students um, going through various programs wondering when they should start that FFL process. Is that something you start while you're in school? Is that some, when, you know what I mean, how, how much time do you allot yourself? When do you start that process? You know, it, it's, it's up to you and your time schedule. If you feel confident enough, that you can you 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 can walk right out of your your um, studies after you finished and go right to work. Yeah, you can start the FFL. That's there's no problem with that. There's no educational requirement for an FFL, not yet. But I can tell you in the future, and this this came from the ATF agent I did with or dealt with that in the, in the future you're probably going to see that. Sure. And I have and I have no doubt in my mind. And I can't say for sure, but 
I think our school would probably be one of those that might qualify for that because we're very we're very into what we do and, mm -hmm. and, and we have a lot of respect in the firearms industry and we'll talk about the firearms industry in a minute and what a tight group it really is. Sure. Um, that picture that's on the screen there, that girl that's sitting in the middle there, that's, that's well, that's my ugly butt on the right, but that's my <laughs> machinist, that was my machinist Robert that's on the left, and that was Beth Bannister, who does a lot of networking for people within the firearms industry, became a really close friend of ours, and helped us a lot. And I tell you, you're going to find real fast that the firearms industry as big as it is, is really a small, tight community. Mm -hmm. And once you get networked, and, and we'll cover that, because, guys, once you get your FFL, you can go to the SHOT Show that nobody else can get into, and you can start networking yourself. And that's why I said there's a lot of legwork. So if, yes, if you feel like that you, can, you want to start, like, say you're three months from graduation, and you want to start the process, go ahead. It's, it's up to you. There's no one that's going to tell you anything different. Now, going back to the requirements, one thing that I would suggest you do is you make sure you follow those instructions to the T and you fill out everything exactly the way they say they want to or it will get kicked back. And it's really not that hard, but they are very anal when it comes to, to procedures. That's the government, okay? And as long as you do everything, like they say, you're not going to have any problem. I don't see it. Unless, unless you can't get zoning or something that says you can't do it. They want to see that proof. You will send a copy of your business licenses. And that. And in my case, I had to have that letter to show them that I was zoned. Um, you will have to send all that kind of documentation to them. But you're going to find out it's not as, as painful as a lot of people tell you the horror stories. If they had problems, it's because they did something wrong. And that's just that simple. Sure. Um, my ATF agent ended up becoming a friend of mine who I called regularly. Hey, am I doing this right? <laughs> you know, and uh, he'd be like, "Yeah, you're doing everything fine." You know, and we've had a couple people chime in over the months. You know, every time I feel like every time we talk about ATF agents, they get such a bad rap. Um, but a ton of people have chimed in and said, "Yeah, I got my FFL, and my ATF agent is awesome too." We talk all the time. So don't yeah. be scared. <laughs> yeah, I mean they, they, they like guns too. Right, right. <laughs> That's why they're Absolutely. ATF agents. <laughs> but, but seriously though, they're they're a great bunch of people. I've never had a bad issue with them. Okay. Yeah. Now, if you, as long as you keep accurate records, and, and they'll go over all that with you, you will have to keep a firearms book or a gunsmithing book. If you're going to sell firearms, which you can do with your O1, you could you can have a gun store as well. They will, you'll have two books. You'll have a gunsmithing book and you'll have your firearm sales book. But they will go over all that with you and show you how to do that, fill out the forms, everything. That's why they're there with you for two or three hours in the interview. Right. Because they go over everything you need to know. And then it's up to you to read whatever they leave and, and, and you know, make sure you know what you're doing. Yeah, and so, abide by it, yeah. Exactly. So, so I would say with your FFL process, the second thing I would tell you to do is talk to an attorney. You should definitely have an attorney on hand just to advise you on the legalities of, of what you may or may not want to specialize in. Some of you may want to go right off the bat. We may have some very experienced people listening and say, hey, I'm going right into building suppressors. I'm going to go right into doing that. Well, if you did that, You'd have to be a machinist. You'd have to have all that kind of equipment. But what you've got to have is some specialty licenses. And that's where your attorney can come in and advise you about legalities of liabilities and things like that. The third thing you're going to need, I should say a third. Well, yeah, we'll call him the fourth. But the third thing you should have is your insurance. Insurance is a must. You want to protect yourself out there because you're dealing with firearms, guys. So there, there's liability there. Your big corporations, Remington, uh, Beretta, everybody else out there, they have insurance right down to the mom and pop shop. I had insurance, and that's going to be a big question. I know a lot of people want to know about insurance, and, and I'll just touch on it now. I don't like to steer people towards any particular type of insurance. You pick who you want to. The biggest question I get about insurance is, is affordability because they've looked at it, and it's very expensive. 
So I'm just going to go out there and I'm going to tell you who I used. And it's up to you whether or not you might want to be interested. I went through the business affiliation of the NRA. And I found my insurance to be very affordable and it covered me like crazy. I had over a million dollars per gun I worked on, liability insurance. I had uh, insurance, you know, on the business because I sold firearms at one point. Mm -hmm. And they were great. They helped me. They helped, you know, there are several things. Just, just check them out. And that's as far as I'm going to plug it. Okay. But, but they, um, one thing I will tell you this is that the liability thing is a very serious thing. If you're going to be doing trigger work, if you're going to be doing other things, you, you want to do it. And that's why you want to talk to your lawyer because your lawyer may suggest that you do a liability release form or may tell you to put this on your paperwork. That's something we had done, and I would highly suggest it. And that, that's it. Now, fourth thing you want to do is you want to, unless you're a brilliant person, and I'm not, <laughs> you, <laughs> I haven't hired a CPA. <laughs> Yep. Okay, because remember, folks, you're in business for yourself, and you're liable for any money you make in taxes and everything else that goes with that. And they can also steer you out of trouble and advise you on ways to grow your business financially. So that's a, that's a great way to, to go as well. It's well worth the money, and there's no headaches. I mean, I can't tell you how easy it is to say, oh, got a letter, bring it to me. That was great. I didn't have to right. sweat nothing. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> I yeah, like painless. And, and I think, <laughs> don't we all? Um, and, and in case anybody's out there freaking out about, oh my God, how am I going to afford all of this? Um, I think it can be done. A lot of these things can be done, like Kip was saying, inexpensively. CPAs are oh, out yeah. there and ready to, you know what I mean? There are a lot of them you can choose from. Don't, don't let, you, having a team of professionals behind you who specialize in the things that you don't specialize in is important, you know? We would, we would definitely, oh, okay, Nathan Brock is asking, one was lawyer, two was what, three was insurance, four was CPA. What was number two? I can't remember what we said. <laughs> well, uh, to, the, the insurance, okay, the, let's just run it out again. FFL. FFL, okay. Lawyer, and you might want to talk to lawyer first, really, if you want to get to that. Yeah. But the FFL okay. process is cut and dry. So FFL, lawyer, insurance. CPA. Okay. That's the main place to go. Okay. Now you're free. Now you got your bases covered. Now you're free to go play, as I call it. Right. Now you can get do the stuff you like to do. Right. Yeah, you can get creative with your business cards and things of that nature. And I'm not going to touch too much on that because that's going to be a question that's going to go to Jennifer here pretty quickly. Because mm -hmm. I have a couple of students that's actually emailed me and had questions for Jennifer. Oh, good. Okay. And, and uh, one of the things I'm going to tell you guys right now is word of mouth. Word of mouth is everything. Yeah. So let's talk about ethics. Yep, I'm going to give you a lesson in ethics. Here we I go, right? <laughs> don't do anything you're not qualified to do and don't promise anything that you cannot do. That is the number one rule in Kip's world. People will respect you so much more if you're honest. Hey, I've learned gunsmithing, but I've never done that. Give me some time to do some research on it. I'll call you when I'm ready, and I'll get it done. People will respect you more for that right there. Yep. Okay? Because people love their firearms. And if somebody brings you a gun, for instance, and it's a 9 millimeter Luger and you're not aware that it's a World War II relic and you go to doing your thing on it and he comes back and looks at you and says, what have you done? Oh, God. Because you've now taken a four to $7,000 value gun and made it worth two or 300 bucks. Oh. That's not a good thing. Right. <laughs> right. And they will tell, and it's like Jennifer's heard me say a hundred times, Jennifer, what do I say? If you do something great, they'll tell 10 people. If you do something wrong, they tell everybody, everybody in the world. Yep. That's right. <laughs> and in this modern day of Facebook and, and all the other things out there, there's a lot of people they can reach. So yeah, that's, that's right. That's that's the number, the, you know, I won't say the number one thing, but in ethics-wise, you want some strong ethics, you know, and don't rip people off. Right. You know, judge, know your, your area and what people can afford. 
Yeah, get into pricing a little bit. Uh, you know, a lot of these questions, um, and I'll, I'll rattle off a couple of them because they all tend to ask along the same lines here. How much do you know what to charge? Um, and then there are a couple in here that talk about um, what would you consider, would you consider charging cheap prices to do gunsmithing initially to drum up business? What's an appropriate markup percentage? That type of thing. So let's go okay. with some of those. If I'm brand new and I'm not known by anybody and I come into an area that uh, there's some other gunsmiths out there. Okay, let's, let's give you an example. I'm the brand new guy on the block. Nobody's ever heard of me. The guy down the street has been on six television shows, has been on every firearms channel you can think of, and he's commanding X amount of dollars. Am I going to be able to command that? No. <laughs> No. But what I can do is go half or lower or down to where I think that what I'm worth at the time. Okay? Confidence will bring pay scale. And what I mean by that is is don't sell I tell most people don't do it any less than, than forty five dollars an hour. Okay? Because that's what people you know, that's you you're a professional. You need to get paid for your knowledge. But if you, if you go too quick and you say, okay, I want $100 an hour, most people that come to your door can't afford $100 an hour. Mm -hmm. So unless you live in an area where people make six figures all the time, there you can do it. Now, I will give you an example of that. I lived in a place called Columbia, Tennessee. Um, I kind of wish Zeke was online because he can elaborate on this. But yep. And Columbia, Tennessee is a rural farm community, okay? In a farm community like that, people don't make a lot of money. Now, right up where Zeke lives, and, and there's an area called Cool Springs. Cool Springs is a, is a super high-dollar, high-paying area, music stars, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They don't care. <laughs> right. So you could command more money there than you could there. And by doing what I did, I started out at $45 an hour or $40 an hour. I can't remember which it was now. And I had more people come through the door than I would have if I charged that much. And I would much rather have more people coming in for little things paying me than I would a few people coming in every now and then. And that's what you have to look at. Also, I tell people, price out a job. Give people a rounded number. A lot of people are on budgets, so they don't want to hear hourly. Hey, I got a broken trigger in my grandpa's gun. What can you do it for? Okay, let me look and see. Go to your parts catalog. Go online to number it, whoever you're going to get your parts from. See how much you're going to pay. Mark it up. Okay, I say good, good, 30%. Uh, make you some profit, but don't make it outrageous. And then figure in how long it's going to take you. It's going to take me about an hour. Okay, well, it's going to cost you $75. They will deal with that easier than saying $45 an hour because they don't know if you're that guy that's going to milk it out for six hours. Right. So there's some things you have to price out. Now, there may be a situation where there's a, a problem with a gun and you don't know what you're going to get into until you get in there. Okay, here's what I did there. I would tell people that there's a minimum of $35 for me to look at your gun. And I will tell you what's wrong with the gun, but if you decide to get it repaired, I would apply that $35 to the time already that you have in the gun. Mm -hmm. Okay? That stops the people from shopping you out, for one thing, but it also gives the customer an opportunity to make a decision if they can afford it or not afford it or come back later, but you still get paid for your time because that's, let's face it, time is money. Right. And, and that's what you're there for. You're not, you know, you can, a lot of times I gave some things away and stuff, and I used to have people tell me, Kip, you're too nice. And, you know, in some cases they might have been right. In some cases I feel like I did the right thing. That's a judgment call you have to make. Sure. And, uh, but you can see, like, on that little bench right there, there's a mini-14s, there's, there's, there's pistols hanging there and stuff. It was amazing to me, once I was legally set up, how fast the worm started to turn. 
and they would tell their friends, and they would tell other people, and I can tell you right now that, that each and every one of you have that potential. It doesn't take a lot of money to go. You talked about insurance. What's the cost? It cost me, I think it was right around $1,500. I don't think it was that. Maybe about $1,200 something dollars a year for my insurance policy. I thought mm -hmm. that was pretty cheap. Right. Okay. Yeah, 100 bucks have, a month, you know, yeah, to, to, to have, have your, that kind of coverage. Your rear covered, yep. You know, they covered the gun shop, they covered you know, people getting hurt in the shop, they covered everything. You know, they, they put a, a million dollar liability on me per gun, I mean, that kind of thing. I mean, it was just, it was very affordable. I priced it outside of there, and it was outrageous. So, sure. you know, because a lot of people out there, folks, are not firearm friendly. <laughs> right. <laughs> or, or knowledgeable, and what good does that do you, you know? Right, right. So, you, you, being that who I went through, they're very pro-gun, as we all know, mm -hmm. and it was, uh, it was just part of standard. So, I would suggest looking at those options. Uh, the FFL total cost for me was the application fee, and the, uh, I'd say for everything for me to get started totally, I would say, because the consultation with your lawyer, free. Right. Consultation with your CPA, free. So, all together, I think I had about maybe $600 to get going. And what about tools? A lot of people are asking about startup tools and, and all that. I bought them as I needed them. Okay. That's exactly how I did it. I had a, a killer set of tools because, like I said, I've been a marine mechanic and had a lot of tools and stuff. So, I had a lot of tools. So, and you'd be surprised at how many tools that you guys, especially you guys that tinker with cars and other things at home, you've already got the tools you need to get going, and SDI gives you the rest of them that you definitely need to start working as a gunsmith. Sure. Okay? When you first start out, you're going to replace lots of parts. That's part of gunsmithing. You know, we don't go right into building custom rifles. Not everybody comes in and says, hey, build me a $10,000 rifle. Right. You know, <laughs> you know but, but they will come in and say, hey, I got a broken part. Fix it. That's your bread and butter. Yeah. And, and you know, and, and accept the challenge. If it's the gun, like, one thing that really helped me, guys, um, and I'm going to touch on this in a minute because this is a question that came to me, but one thing that really touched on me is don't just learn all these modern guns that are out there now. Glocks are cool. This is cool. HK, all that. That's great. And the more of that you know, definitely, because you're going to see a lot of them. But you're going to see a lot of old-fashioned guns coming into your shop. And you better have that knowledge, too, because nothing impresses a customer more than when they can bring you an old relic gun. You say, hey, I can fix that, no problem. Mm -hmm. And that, that really will help you out a lot, especially when you're dealing with collectors. And collectors have lots of guns. Right. And that's that's a, like the gun you're seeing there on the table. There's another example, folks. That gun came to me because the guy didn't know how to get the Cosmoline out. So that gun was stripped, clean, and I did it all for $75. Mm -hmm. He was happy. He was happy as can be to get that done. Next week, he brought me two more. Isn't that great? So that's it how is. it gets going. And and I'll tell you because this is my you know realm of the industry here. From a marketing perspective and a sales perspective, it is exponentially, it costs exponentially less to retain a customer than it does to find a new customer. Um, so what Kip has been saying about ethics and how you will operate and, and all of those things, um, those aren't just because you should be a good person and do it that way. Even from a cost per perspective, from a return on investment perspective, once that person's in the door, it costs less money for you to get them back in the door than it would ever cost to find another person to walk into the door. That's a, one of those, you know, marketing givens. Um, so just to chime in there, it's super important. Exactly what Kip's talking about right now, uh, that type of thing, it should be a huge chunk of your business. These should be repeat customers, people who are bringing you different guns or the same gun multiple times if they're that type of person. Um, yes. But you, you want to keep those guys around. You want to keep those customers around. So. Absolutely. And they'll bring their friends. Yep. That's exactly <laughs> they will right. They bring their friends. And, and uh, you know, right now you guys have a golden opportunity. 
you guys you guys have it better than, than we had it when we started. And a lot of people say, what do you mean? There's more guns out there yeah, now and being time. sold now than right. there ever was when I got into this. Right. And, and, Absolutely. You, and, and they all need gunsmiths. There's a shortage of gunsmiths, people. There's a shortage of gunsmiths. Yeah, there's that's why there's a six-month turnaround time on some of the, you know? Yeah. Some of these guys, you you know, you take it in, and you've got months and months and months to wait. That's that's a, you know, that's a, that's classic shortage right there. So. Right. And another tip I'll give them real fast for success: when you're in your gun seasons, okay. For instance, it's hunting season. Prioritize your hunting rifles. Tell the customer who comes in with something that's not for that season. Okay, I can get to this for you, but there's going to be a wait. Could be three or four weeks because it's hunting season, and all my hunting guys are bringing everything here, and I got to get them turned in and turn around. Yeah. And they understand. They okay. I understand. I'm good with that. You you just got to talk to people, you know, and that's that's yeah. where a lot of people I think make a big mistake. And the more personal you are, the more they're going to like you. The more they're going to come back. They're going to say, hey. The guy is a good guy. He don't just take your money and run. He'll talk to you. He explains it to you. And that's where we come to one of the questions that I have, unless Jennifer wants me to elaborate more on this. There's one follow-up question that actually has been asked a couple times and was um, a chime in from earlier today. So just before we move into the marketing and things like that, Ronald asks, when does gunsmithing end and manufacturing begin? So this that's kind of goes... To, to, to us, all I can say is that's up to you. Okay. If you if you want to take that step and try to manufacture something, then hey, God love you, more power to you. And you'll you'll need special licensing from from your F, from the ATF. Mm -hmm. You'll need a lot of insurance, <laughs> sure. and and you'll need a lot of lawyers, and you'll need a lot of CPAs, and you'll you'll need a lot of things that that go hand in hand with doing that. But if you feel you have something, but I will tell you this. Let me give you one little hint. The, the one thing I do know, and I, and I have some very close friends, as we all do here at SDI, um, that do that, that manufacture stuff. Mm -hmm. And you used, to see, you used to see them on TV, okay? Mm -hmm. And Jennifer, I'm talking about Atlas, okay? Yeah, I, I, I think And, and uh, those guys, you know, they would tell you this, too. If you're just going to copy what other people are doing out there, you might think twice about it because the market gets fickle and it gets funny. Uh, it has one one year this gun's the most popular, next year this gun's the most popular, or that may become obsolete. People who manufacture do so because they have something special to offer that nobody else has. Those are the guys that you see making the big bucks. Okay, but please understand this, guys. If you're looking at doing something like that, it's going to cost you big bucks to make big bucks. And that's right. that's a fact. That's just a fact of life. There's also patents and copyrights. That's why I said you'll need more lawyers. <laughs> right, right. You, know, you, you have to protect your product. And, and uh, you, know, you know, Jennifer, I think in the future a great person to have on here might be Joe Mo. Joe Mo. Just, just about manufacturing. I'll see if we can get him on here. We have some. But, but yeah, I hope that answers his question. I think so. Um, yeah, so let's go ahead and move forward. There are a couple follow-up questions, but I think they're going to align nicely when we get into the marketing side. Okay. Um, so you just do whatever whatever your next step was. Go for it, and I'll, I'll well, keep trying. Here's what I want to say. One question I get, and something we do at SDI that I'm very proud of, and I am very pro uh, uh, for doing this, we teach history. Mm -hmm. We teach you the history of the firearm from the, the times that it first came about to, to the time. In fact, I think we should teach war, okay? <laughs> but it would take a long, long course to do that. I know. <laughs> it goes all the way back to cavemen throwing stones, okay? Right, right. But, but you guys need to know that we cover a really good history of firearms and how they changed. And the reason we do that is... And this is what's going to impress your customer. When your customer can come in with an old relic gun, set it down, and you know what that gun is. You know what system that is. And you know the history behind that gun. And you give him a brief history lesson. He walks up there saying, wow, that's my gunsmith. 
Now I can say that because about 90% of my clients have said that to me when I was gunsmithing. And they were impressed by it. And we do that at SDI. So when you go through the basic courses that we teach and you see that, well, I got to learn that, that's what we're doing for you. Right. Study it. Because when you can tell everybody that, hey, you know, when the German Luger came out and they did this in World War II and this is the maker of it and this is who made it and this is how the system worked and stuff, they are impressed because guess what, folks? Some of them don't know and they want to know that, but they're too ashamed to say, how does it work? Hmm. Because it was passed down to them by Grandpa. Well, and what a great way to prove that you know what you're talking about, too. You know, yes. that's got to let people feel a little bit more comfortable with leaving their firearms with you, you know? Yeah, trust me, the, the baffling with the BS don't work, okay? Right, but when right. You, but when you, can, when you can show that you have this, this, this background and you know this knowledge, you know, it's not just recognizing the gun and saying, oh, that's a, that's a Remington 810. <laughs> you know, that's, that's not what we're getting at here. What we're getting at here is, is saying that, okay, for, I'll give you an example. I had a man bring a gun one time, and Jennifer knows this story. Or, or actually, it was a lady, and she brought the gun in, and she says, I got this gun. I don't want it no more. I inherited it. I don't know if it's worth anything. It's in a sock here, you know. Can you tell me how much it's worth? Could you at least give me three hundred dollars for it? Mm -hmm. I pull the gun out. I take a look at the gun. And I say, "Oh my God!" <laughs> and I look at the gun. I look at the serial number. I look at the proof marks that we also teach you at SDI. Mm -hmm. and, then, and I realize that, ma'am, who told you this gun was only worth a couple hundred dollars? Well, the guy down the street. And I said, "Well, ma'am, the guy down the street's lying to you." Because what you have here is an original 1861 Peacemaker Colt. Oh, cool. And I said, the minimum price I would put on this gun, and the gun was a great statement, I said, I could probably get you anywhere from, I am not sure how much or how much, but, you know, we're talking several thousands of dollars. I thought she was going to faint. <laughs> and her son said, are you serious? I said, yes, I'm very serious. Another example, had an old uh, a, a Winchester 22 came in went to two gunsmiths that were in my town. They said, well, it's jamming up. It's not working. They took it to a big-name gunsmith in the big money town, and he said, ah, you know, it's not working right, but, you know, we'd be happy to buy it for you for parts. He'd give you a couple hundred, a couple hundred oh, bucks for geez. it. The man bought it in an auction for about 400 I said, okay. I thought it was a Browning when I first looked at it because I didn't pay no attention to it. Robert went ahead and wrote it up. We put it in a gun case safe, but... I said, hey, Robert, get that old gun out. Let me take a look at it. He said, that gun looks brand new, Kip. And I looked at it, and I said, oh, crap. This is the original Winchester 22. <laughs> and it's like brand new. And I said, I can tell you why it's jamming, because they're shooting 22s in it, and Winchester made a special 22 round for this gun. And you can still get the ammo. I called the man up and said, hey, why don't you come back and get your gun? He goes, why, you're not going to work on it? I says, no. I says, it's not. It's not nothing wrong with it. And I tried to explain. I said, are you sitting down? He goes, yeah. He says, my wife is still chewing at me out because I bought that at the auction for $400. I said, well, tell her it's worth, tell her right now it's worth about $1,800. <laughs> and going up. <laughs> right. So, but, guys, if I hadn't known the history and learned about the patent marks and things like that, I could have never have done that. And that's what we do at SCI. You're going to learn that stuff. So, for my students that are listening, that send me those emails. And you have a couple. There are a couple of them in here. Calvin well, says, see it them, sounds like but... every paper he ever wrote for you. <laughs> <laughs> but when you get that, you say, Kip, why do I have to know this history? That's why. Because we want you to recognize the fact when somebody brings in a, a regular uh, Hawk and Kit black powder rifle compared to somebody who brings one in that was in the Revolutionary War. Right. And you guys, you will see that. In the state of Tennessee, there was a lot of Civil War people there. They had passed down their guns to their families for years and hung them over the fireplace. I've had them come into my shop. Nobody knew what they were. Thought they were worth just maybe 50 bucks, and they turned out to be worth thousands of dollars. Cool. So that's why we make you do the history. Now, I hope I've covered that question. Yes. 
Now, another big question that since we were on the business side of things, I want to go into right now because I think it's time to let the expert talk on this one. And this is going for Jennifer. And I had two students that said, Kip, when it comes to social media, we're in a big social media world. What's the best way to get started on a budget? And I thought, you know, I really can't answer that. Jennifer, this is your expertise. You take this one. Okay. So um, there are a couple things that, in my, in my opinion, need to happen. And, and a lot of this stuff can be done at little or no expense. Um, where it starts to get dicey is when you have to, as a startup business owner, which I was one myself, you know, I, I have been in those shoes, um, there will come a time when you have to say, is this worth my billable hour time? You know what I mean? Is this taking away from what I could be making money on? Am I messing too much with the website or the Facebook page or the whatever? Um, and it's taking away from actual time that I could be working or networking or getting more clients or whatever the case may be. So keep in mind, there will be a law of diminishing returns there. There's going to be a breaking point where you'll need to say, I'm far too busy to do this. It would make more sense for me to hire this out. I, I hope that much success for everybody. You know, that's going to there. Hopefully, you'll have enough success that 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 will be a point for you. However, when you're first getting started, there's a ton of stuff that you can do. Like I said, at little or no cost. The first couple things you can do, um, in my opinion, you will need a website. You will need a business card. You will need a logo. You will need a unified front as far as branding goes. Um, we've done a whole webinar kind of on marketing your startup both on ground and off site and um, you can find that link on our YouTube page though that will get into more detail than we'll get into tonight but I would highly highly recommend a professional looking website if you want to do that yourself there are companies out there that do temp template based websites kind of drag and drop types of things that you can do for cheap 20 bucks a month and you get the website and the hosting and the domain name and that type of thing the homesteads one of them you could do Wix. You could do um, there. I think Web.com does one. You know, th there are a million of them like that that you could do. Um, if you're not tech savvy, hire it out. You can find a random. You know, go on Craigslist even if you need to. Couple hundred dollars. Have somebody build you a very basic five-page website. Website with a, you know, homepage, services about us. You know, humanizing aspect. Who you are. You know. If you're local and you've born and raised, you know, put that type of thing in there. How to how they contact you? If you want to put pricing in there, all of that stuff's important. Facebook page is free to set up, even for a business. I would absolutely set that up. The thing about a, anything social media is that you have to put in the time to consistently post things, and the best posts have images attached, and they're not about selling things. Even if you're a business and you're selling guns, we you, the actual social media aspect of your business should not be primarily about selling guns. People don't like to be sold to. It makes people uncomfortable. You know, if they want to buy something, they'll go to your shop. So social media would be a great place to share pictures of projects that you're working on or your, you know, customer spotlights or anything that you're doing in the, in the community. If you're sponsoring a shooter at a, you know, at a at a local match, for example, post about that. Post about things that make your business um, more of a person than a business. That's what is most successful in social media. I would absolutely set up a Facebook page coming from specifically the firearms demographic. Now, if you were, if you were a clothing shop for teenagers, you would want to go more Snapchat and Instagram, and that's fine. Um, the firearms industry, however, is much, much heavier in Facebook and Twitter. So just a pro tip for you, if you're just starting out, although Instagram is really gaining and has for the last couple um, years now, if you're going to pick some, I would stick to Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I wouldn't mess with any of these other little bits and pieces. Um, it's also smart and free to set up profiles and really kind of, I use the term bedazzle them. I know that's a super girly term, um, but I'd spend some time putting up any details that you have, any services you offer, any pictures you have on um, review types of sites. So that would be your Yelps and your Mantas, um, that type of thing. Anything where you could post a, somebody could post a review. Your Google business page is a huge one. Um, if you don't know how to do these things, Google it. You know, it, it's, it's easy. That all of that information exists and it doesn't take even a very tech savvy person to do it. You don't have to be great on a computer to set up a 
an account with um, City Search. You know, that's a that's another review type of site, um, or Yelp or Manta, or like I said, any of those. All of these things are free. Setting up the Facebook page, setting up the Twitter account, setting up the Instagram account, setting up the um, Mantas and the Yelps and all that stuff. Completely free. In fact, don't pay for anything. If they if any if anybody calls you and says, hey, I, I see that you set up. Uh, you know, an account at Manta, and they will. They will call you and try to upsell you on SEO services and things like that. At this point, you don't need it. You know, you're just trying to get your name out there um, and set up your standard basic web reputation. So don't worry about paying for any of those things just yet. Um, but like I said, from a social media perspective, uh, it's, it's really important to be posting things consistently for small businesses, three to five times a week is pretty good. Um, in a perfect scenario, it would be once a day, twice a day. But really, when you're first starting out, aim for three to five posts per week. Um, typically, and another pro tip for you, um, typically, middle of the week and Fridays do best. So Tuesday, Thursday, Friday are really good days for social media. Um, shockingly, and this is different for Twitter, but Facebook specifically, um, weekend posts, for some reason, don't get as many interactions um, as weekday posts. I don't, nobody really knows particularly why, but that's what the stats are. Um, and again, I can't stress enough, uh, personal posts and images. Don't just post, we're having a sale this weekend, you know, just the words. It's got to be something that people will want to engage with. Um, those are all things you can do, like I said, for free. Now, if you want to actually dip your toe into spending money um, advertising, the first thing that I would recommend doing is I would recommend setting up a page on your website that will collect a person's information in case they want more information about you, your services, or want to put in a request for a service. We call that a landing page. Um, it would basically just be a standard website page with a contact form on there. Um, very, very basic, maybe a little bit of information on the top that says, hi, thank you for visiting, you know, Big Irish LLC. Um, please put your information in and we'll have somebody contact you. That form, especially if you're doing one of these template-based website building services or if you're having somebody custom build it, obviously, those, can be, those little notifications, if you ever get a lead, you get that directly into your email, like your inbox. It'll hit your inbox, it'll say, hey, Jennifer McKinnis is looking for more information pick up the phone and call the person. That's online business 101. You know, that's that's how you get started um, actually make it, spending and making money, you know. So create yourself a landing page. Um, Facebook ads are easy to do and I think very affordable. Um, I would start with a couple hundred, you know, 200, 250 bucks a month or something for a lead type of um, advertising campaign. That part can get a little bit in depth, and again, we, we went over that a little bit more in that other webinar that we did that was specifically focused on online and on-ground marketing. Um, so you may want to check that webinar out. Uh, otherwise, again, Google it. This is all stuff that exists. You, do, you absolutely do not have to be somebody who's been in marketing for a decade to know how to set up a Facebook ad. Um, if you want, here's another pro tip. Um, you know, if you're if this is the type of things, oh, uh, Nathan has asked where you can find the previous webinars. Go to YouTube and search for SDI um, or SDI School. I think is our YouTube tag. Maybe uh, might be SDI Schools. Um, all of our webinars are in their own little. You know, we have little um, playlists. So some of them are testimonials, some of them are gunsmithing tips, etc. The webinars are all in one one space. Um, so you should be able to see all of the. Uh, titles for the webinars and everything there too. Um, we, I, I always hear this, and Scott, I, I hear you loud and clear on this. Facebook will not let gun dealers do ads. I've tried. They're not gun friendly. Okay, you can't, let me um, clarify that a little bit because I agree and I disagree. Um, you can't sell guns on Facebook. And that's in their, you know what I mean, that's, that's just against their rules and regulations. However, you can advertise a gun business. We do it every single day. We're we're a gun school. It's an education, but we're all about we don't sell, we don't we don't offer any courses that don't have something that aren't gun related, you know. So that's we run ads 
all the time as a school. Uh, Penn Foster, AGI, all, the, all of these people that are that I pay attention to, you know, in the in the gun industry, run ads. And I'll tell you, our ads have guns plastered all over them. It's not that Facebook <laughs> is is not gun friendly. Okay, Facebook's not necessarily gun friendly, but they're not going to stop you as long as you're staying within their guidelines. Um, so if you're a gunsmithing business, for example, uh, as long as you're not saying buy and sell guns right in the ad, you know, tr find your way around that. Find creative ways um, to say that you're available in a local and a you know local shop and all that good stuff, and don't make it blatantly obvious that you're selling a gun with this ad. You know what I mean? You offer other services. You fix guns. You repair things. You you know what I mean? That's we want to stay away from having Facebook see our gunsmiths sell guns on Facebook. That's again that like I said, that's against their rules. But you absolutely should be able to run an ad for your small business that does not sell a gun via that ad. If I might interject real quick, what absolutely. I did what I, what I did is I also found that they didn't want me to advertise a uh, gun shop. Okay, so what mm -hmm. I did, you're a gunsmith. So what I did was I put repair services and yep. then plastered was me with my picture of American gunsmithing, my Perfect. number, everything, and they were fine with that. They never exactly said a word. Right. So Perfect. if you're going to do gunsmithing, put repair services. That's yep. all you got listed under. Go ahead, that's Exactly Jennifer. right. Nope, that's, ex that's, that's, I'm glad you said that. That's what I was looking for. Um, so yeah, I would, I would absolutely look into, if you're looking for a way to spend money on social media, Facebook ads are a great way to do that because they let you drill down to an audience that likes what you like. So you can you can say, hey, listen, if I'm in Nashville or just the state of Tennessee, I'm going to target people in the state of Tennessee um, that are primarily male and they're from the ages of 24 to 55 and they like, um, you know, Browning and Brownell and the U.S. military and... Uh, the Outdoor Channel and all of these things. You know, what do you like? What is it that you that people who come to you? What do they like? You'll be able to actually say to Facebook, "Please put my ad in front of the people who like these following things." And to me, that's the coolest part of these Facebook ads. I know I'm a little bit of a you know, Facebook ad nerd, um, but that's the coolest part to me is being able to really drill down to an audience, put your ad out to the right type of people. And make sure that they'll, in, when you're setting up those ads, it'll say, hey, where do you want me to drive? If they click on this ad, where do you want it to go? And you put your landing page in there. And you see how it goes. Test it out for a month or two. If it's not worth your money, you know, figure out what an ROI would be for you um, on, on gaining a lead. Uh, make sure you follow up with that person. You know, a lot of people miss that step. A lot of people don't connect those dots. They'll, they'll get a lead. It'll sit in their inbox. They'll forget to check their email for two or three days, and then that lead has run cold. Well, that's that's you know that's something you can absolutely improve on. So, um, yeah. And and what about listing it under sporting goods and hunting? I would absolutely say that would be fine. Yep, Ashley. Um, as far as the, those advertising things, because we know that that Facebook has limitations pertaining specifically to the firearms industry. I say get creative. If you're a gun guy and I'm a gun guy, I'm going to know what you mean, like Kip said, if you're holding a rifle and saying repair work. You know, that's, exa that's exactly what we're talking about. Find ways to get around that. Um, your audience is there. It exists on Facebook. Um, and, and they're eager and ready to find a good gunsmith. You know, that's like we were saying before, we're, we're in a shortage here. So um, I think you'd, you can absolutely... Um, you know, you can you can absolutely find ways around that. So, okay, so I know we're running out of time. Let me scroll through these. Kip, um, a lot of people have asked about, and let me make sure I'm at least getting through um, stuff that people have asked tonight as well. I have just a million of them, you know, from the last couple. Uh, let's see here. Curious, I'm curious the best ways to take care of firearms and the tools and resources in high humidity areas. Do you have any opinions on that? Uh, just a few. I live in Florida. I was just uh, going to say, now that you're not back <laughs> down here, yeah. <laughs> uh, listen, keep it oiled. Yeah. You know, t basic, basic tool care. Wipe your stuff down, you know, with a light oily rag. And same with your guns, you know. You, you have your... Uh, uh, 
the, the, the uh, wipe down rags, you know, have the silicone and stuff like that, and wipe them down, just keep them wiped, and, and, and that's the best way to do it. Yeah. You know, um, the, the guns that rust typically, first of all, let me just say this. For those of you who don't know, most guns are blued, right? Okay. Bluing is the, is the rusting of a barrel. So the bluing actually protects it, but you're, you're bluing, it's natural for it to try to get a little surface rust on there. But if you keep them wiped down uh, pretty periodically, like, you know, every time you touch one, wipe it down because the oils in your skin will start to surface rust. Also, the way you store your gun can, can have an effect on that, too. I personally just keep mine in my gun safe locked in there. I don't wrap them up in anything, but it's because I go in there, you know, at least once a, every two weeks and I wipe them down. And as long as you're doing things like that, your, your guns are going to stay fine. Uh, you know, uh, you're not going to have a problem, especially if you have stainless guns. You don't have to worry about them too much anyway. But blue guns, that's what you do. You just keep them wiped down and do your general maintenance. And if you're an avid shooter, you're going to be doing that anyway because you got to clean your gun when you shoot it. Right, right. And, and that's the other bad habit. People have bad habits of shooting their gun, throwing it in the, the – uh, the, the locker, locker or, or the um, safe, mm -hmm. and they never touch it. They, you know, they'll wait for six months, and yeah, it's going to have rust on it, you know, because it's been neglected. Right. So that's where it comes in. And if, as a gunsmith, you want I'll give you all a tip right now. They said, Kip, what do I do when a customer brings in? It's got a little surface rust on it. I don't need to reboot. What do I do to get rid of it? He wants me to get it off there. I laugh. I said, Okay, I'll tell you one of my tricks. You get you some 4 aught steel wool, you take your gun oil that you like the best, you saturate it in there, and you lightly go over it, very lightly, wipe it, go over it, wipe it, and the surface rust is gone, the bluing has not been removed, and the customer is thrilled to death to pay your bill. There you go. <laughs> so there's a tip for you right there on restoration. <laughs> yeah, we're, in fact, we're working on some restoration things, and we're going to show people how to do some cool things in the future, but I won't go into that either. Sure. But, um, but yeah, that, that's, that's it. So what's the next one? Okay, um, this one's a cool one. What qualifications do employers look for when hiring a gunsmith? And you can, you can probably speak to this in a couple different ways, Kip, so I'm interested to hear what you have to say about that. Well, first of all, they're going to look at what you know, what you, what you claim to know, okay? Okay. Um, Certainly walking in with some certification is a big plus because it tells them that, number one, you're serious about being a gunsmith, mm -hmm. okay? Now, when it comes from, there's, there's several of them out there, and some of those, I'm not going to mention names because we can't, but some employers will look at that like, yeah, but I can tell you right now, nobody's going, yeah, to SDI. Mm -hmm. We're getting such respect out of the firearms industry, and when they check us out, it gets even more, and it, you're going to see that keep growing. So that's going to give you an extra advantage in your foot in the door when you go in there and you face a man like me who's been doing it for 30-something years, <laughs> right. and they come in and say, well, I can know how to gunsmith it. Yeah, okay, I've heard that a hundred times. Yep. You know, in fact, I wish uh, when Robert was with me, Robert would tell you I averaged, and he probably saw two, uh, in six months, I probably had seven guys come in and want an apprentice. Oh, I bet. Not, yeah. None yeah. of them had any background. None of them had a background whatsoever. One of them said he could machine. Robert interviewed him and just shook his head like no. So, and and but now if somebody had came in and said, hey, I graduated SDI, I would have known the school. I would have said, okay, what do you want to do? And then you go for a formal interview. You know, it's just like getting any other job. You got an interview sure. process. Right. You got to sell yourself. Okay. But there again, some people talk, and and sometimes I throw them for a loop. I say, okay, well, um, you know, if if you got this problem, what would you do? Sure. And, and a lot of them can't answer you that. But right. I can tell you right now that question I used to ask people: if you take SDI's course, you can answer that. <laughs> Okay, and I didn't even know what was in their course at that time, you know. <laughs> so, so that's that's something right there. You guys need to keep in mind. Um, I think that that uh, just being a very personal and being yourself is a lot of it. Don't go in with an arrogant attitude, because I can tell you right now, they're going to just toss you right out the door. Right. Okay, because another thing too is you might be good enough where they might look at you as a threat. 
Oh, so, sure. so you have to understand that you may deal with some people like that. Now, the people we deal with, um, no, they wouldn't do that. They're, in fact, they want to see people who have the initiative to get out there and learn and have got some training. Training is the basic for all things. Right. And guys, you know, education, I, I'm big on education. You know, I'm a guy that, that graduated high school with a GED that did roamed around a lot of things for years and stuff. And I can tell you, it wasn't until I got education that I started going somewhere in life. Mm -hmm. So so let me just point you in that direction. Uh, when I closed my shop up, it was with the sole purpose of coming on to this school full time so I could teach and be part of this school so you guys out there would be the next generation that takes over and be able to keep the art going because when guys like me die off, we've often wondered what's going to happen to the art. An example is we started teaching checkering. Checkering stocks is, is an art that's being lost. Mm -hmm. It's just like engraving. And guys, there's big money in it. <laughs> so hopefully that will give you an example. Just, just be yourself. Be proud of where you went to school, but don't go in with the attitude you know everything because you don't. I still don't know everything. Sure. No one, you're always learning. This industry changes constantly. Right. Okay. We have one. Let's do. I'm going to do one final question here because about six people have asked it. We have to be really careful answering it, though. And guys, I hope you understand why. Um, so we're going to talk about the executive order for a second. A whole ton of people have asked about it. Um, Kip, what I'd like you to do, though. Okay. So some background for everybody. Because we're a school, we can't issue or we have not issued an official statement on this. So what I'm going to do at this point is um, I'll give you my personal opinion as the director of marketing, you know, or as Jennifer McInnes, um, based on what we've talked about. Uh, and Kip can give you his opinion as well. But this is not SDI's official stance. We, if, if this all goes through, you know, if the, if the executive order actually goes into effect, I'm sure we will probably then issue something. Um, but at this point, we're just going to kind of discuss it as a one-on-one -on -one type of thing to make sure that it's been covered since so many people asked about it. Um, Kip, with that in mind, go ahead and um, so many people have said, and let me, I'll give you a couple of these questions here. Um, oh, there's a glowing review for Kip. Uh, okay. <laughs> How, does, how do the changes to the DDTS definition of manufacturing affect the standard gunsmith? It now requires uh, that if you're drilling, cutting, machining, you're manufacturing, you must register with ITAR, which is $22.50 per year, even if you do not export or import. Um, and, and there are variations of that question. So, so give me, let's dip our toe in that, just so that people, to give some people a peace of mind, you know? Well, uh, that's a very difficult question, guys. Um, it's, it's very troubling to me. Uh, this is something gunsmiths have been doing for years. Mm -hmm. We have cut and thread barrels. We do all these things. Um, as far as the executive order goes, and I'm not a politician, and I'm not a lawyer, and so therefore I'm really not qualified to, to really answer this, but I have not received or any other FFL that I know has not received any notification from the ATF that we must adhere to this. Correct. Until I hear something like that, um, I, I, it, it's hard for me to operate because I'm not in business no more, but I would imagine that most of the gunsmiths are going to take a stance that until ATF tells them otherwise, they're going to continue to operate. And I that's do right, know... Yeah. That's what I we would recommend know. for everybody else as well, you know. Sure. And if you have any questions about it, ask the ATF. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, I do know that when it comes to executive orders and powers, they're limited by Congress, as we know. Yes, they can do them. But it takes Congress to really, as I understand it, let me just say that, as I understand it, and I could be wrong because, like I said, I'm not a politician, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not a constitutional lawyer. <laughs> right. But, but um, I would think that what we know of how our government works, uh, we know that there's been lots of executive orders that's been passed, and some right. were enforced and some were not enforced. And Congress ultimately has to say over what's going to, what can be made into law and what cannot be made into law. 
And as far as I know, there has been no congressional vote on this whatsoever. Um, it's, it's, a, it's one of those situations that what we've been doing is saying, okay, let's see what's going to happen. But as I know of today, there's been no enforcement of this, so I don't know. Uh, that's right. the, I hate to say that, but really, we, Jennifer, <laughs> myself, the school, we really don't know. In fact, um, my suggestion was, what we found out about, was to let our lawyers look at this and see what they say. Yeah, and, and so far, exactly what you've said has, has rung true. You know, so far, this is not something that anybody working as a gunsmith right now needs to worry about today. You know, oh, p potentially ever. I mean, we, we don't know if it's ever going to even go into effect. Exactly. So, you know, that's not something, if you're in school, if you're just starting out, and it seems like, oh my gosh, that 2250 is going to just drown me, which I, I truly hope that even, let's say it goes through. Is that number fun to deal with? No, it's not. But 2250 a year shouldn't necessarily be the make or break for a successful gunsmith. And if it is, wow, we're not operating on very large margins here. You know, we, we want, um, our hope is that it doesn't go through. Nothing ever happens with it, of course. You know, my hope is that nothing ever happens with it. If it does, though, let's look at it in the way of, from a business perspective, we can, you can still deal with it. It's not $22,000 a year. It's $2,200 a year, $2,250. Um, and at this point, it's you know that's not something that should be scaring you out of starting your business, you know, no. or continuing your education or continuing your business, you know. Not none at of, all. It, none of that should be, you know, a, a reason to head for the hills, you know. Not at all. I, I was just going to say, until the ATF tells you otherwise, you operate as normal because yeah. the ATF is the ones who ultimately tell us what to do. They send out notices to us that, hey, you cannot do this anymore. Right. Nobody I know has gotten any letter. In fact, I got a letter the other day from the ATF, and I thought, you know, uh, I'm in the process of having turned my FFL back in because when you transfer from state to state, you have to, especially if you go out of business, and mm -hmm. you have to turn your records in. But when I got the letter the other day, I thought, okay, here it is. This is this is this maybe maybe this is a notification, right. and it was it was just a warning that hey, we've got a lot of people committing fraud. Uh, and breaking into gun shops in Tennessee, so lock your guns up at night. <laughs> That's what it was. Nothing, <laughs> That's nice nothing, of them. Friendly yeah, little was, reminder from the yeah, ATF. exactly. So what I'm trying to say is, is um, yes, we know he signed the, the UN treaty. Yes, we know this is part of that and executive orders. But we also know we're in an election year, guys. Yeah. And if one individual wins this election this year, um, it could be all hell breaks loose. Right. If the other person wins, though, we also know that many of the executive orders that have been passed over the last eight years are about to be thrown out the window with other executive yeah. orders. Yeah, so, we just simply so don't know. Yeah. I would tell everybody, don't operate in fear yet. Let's see what happens because we also have that big organization up there, and I'm going to say it, the NRA, and they're going to fight like tooth and nail over something right. like this. And so they're far, upset. we haven't heard anything. Right. So if they're not upset, I typically don't get upset because when, when someone goes, and I don't care who it is, when someone goes to infringe on the Second Amendment in any way, including our, our ability to make a living, um, usually, you know, it, it, it's lawyers and, and everybody else gets involved, Congress yeah. gets involved, and so far we've heard nothing. So take it take it for what it is. All I can right. tell you is, is my personal opinion on that. Like I said, I am no way an expert on how Washington works. If I <laughs> sure. was, I think I'd be a millionaire by now. Right. So. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so, but, but all I can tell you is um, – Officially, I have never heard anything or gotten any kind of letter or anything came to me as an FFL holder saying that uh, American Gunsmith and Kip Carpenter can no longer do this. Right. That guy you see standing there in the picture, like I said, was Robert, my machinist. You know, we threaded barrels. We did We did a lot of the things they're talking about, and it's perfectly legal at this point. So right. I really don't see this becoming an issue. And like Jennifer said, 
worst case scenario, if the other person got in, maybe we could be crawled through, but I don't think so. Uh, Congress, as you guys know, and this is no secret, anybody can watch news and see this, there's a lot of debate about about um, executive orders. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's going to be a lot of discussion about, there's a lot of, um, of questions by Congress saying that certain things are unconstitutional through the Supreme Court and they get sent to the Supreme Court. And like I said, you know, <laughs> that may get washed right out. And like I said, depending on who wins president, it may wash it right out completely anyway. Sure. So. Yeah, we're, we're really just in a wait and see, you know, type of situation here. So ho hopefully that at least gives you guys something to chew on with that question. Like I said, that's a touchy subject for us because we don't have an official stance on this yet. Uh, and we're hoping that we never will have to. So um, exactly. for now, business as usual. Right. And let uh, me also say that at SDI, uh, just because Jennifer's already here, we're on top of this. Right. We're, we're watching this. So anything that's going to affect the industry and our students, we're going to be the first to tell you. Right. So... Maybe I'll help you sleep better at night. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> so um, we have, I think that's that about wraps it up, but we had one guy just now say, hey, how do I ask a question? So Alex, if you have that question, um, type it in right now. <laughs> um, and other than that, I think we're in pretty good shape. So for those of you who have been here the whole time, <laughs> Alex said he's coming in late. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Um, Best way to advertise starting out, we didn't really talk about that. So let's do this as the very last little topic, just a couple minutes on. We talked about the online version. Kip, let's talk about on-ground advertising starting out really quick. That's easy. Um, <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. See, give them a little rundown on, on what they should be thinking okay. about as a new business owner. Okay, business cards, a must. You can buy them as cheap as nine ninety five. We all know that famous site that you see on TV. Yep. You can get them there, design your own cards. It doesn't have to be fancy. It just has to be simple and factual. That's number one. Two, pass your cards out there. By don't ever leave home. I would say never leave home. Like they said, the American Express, never leave home. Yep. Without it. Well, I said the same thing with your business cards. Never leave home. Get every opportunity you get to mingle. Join Rotary. Join the uh, Chamber of Commerce in your local community. These are all great ways to market and get to know each other and get your word out there. Yep. The newspaper. Local radio sometimes can be very affordable. It wasn't my town anyway. Um, you can do Especially a lot of things like if that. You, if you do AM, just coming, I, that's where I got my start was on the radio business. Uh, yeah. A lot of talk radio, sports talk radio, things like that. You can get really affordable. Hey, my company, my company, American Express, uh, was a sponsor of the Sean Hannity show. So hey, there you go. <laughs> and it worked. And, and guys, do you know how many people I was reaching today? Yeah. Many. Yeah, Many. I mean, exactly I had guys right. on your farm tractors listening to that and say, "America, yeah. guys, I'm going yeah. in there." So, you know, Someday and, and <laughs> exactly. So, but that's another one. But guys, here's the other thing. Uh, a lot of you live in communities where there's gun shows, where there's there's uh, they, take advantage of that stuff. You can just walk in, mingle, meet people, pass out your cards. Uh, also, friends of the NRA, they typically hold banquets all over the country in, in different communities and they raise money for kids shooting sports and things like that. Be a sponsor. Give them some uh, a gunsmithing gift certificate to auction off or give away for a door prize and other uh, things in your community that do the same thing, that, that need things to give away, that they're raising money for charities. Be part of your community. That will get you a lot of business fast. And then post it on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Post it on Facebook. Hey, I'm doing the, uh, you know, a breast cancer awareness shoot or something exactly. like that. Exactly. You know, you know, it, that, these are great things. Give them, give them uh, gift certificates. It doesn't cost you anything but your time. You know, you don't have to include parts. Just put it. It does not include parts, but you'll donate the time. There you go. Um, free gun cleanings. Do, do a... Uh, uh, thing for like a, a lady shooting class. Get to know who your firearms instructors are in your community and say, hey, can I come out and just talk to them about general maintenance? And most of the firearms instructors that do concealed care will say, yeah, man, please do. That's great. Okay? And you get to talk to the ladies and, and, and the other guys that, they're, that don't know how to clean a gun. You show them how. Give them a card. And guess what? They come into you for, to get anything put on. They need a sight put on. They need a laser put on. They're going to come to you. 
So that real fast is, is a lot of ways to do that, and it doesn't cost you nothing but your time <laughs> to get out there and do these things. That's a lot exactly of easy right. leg work. So yes. I think that's a if you do that, you, you you'll benefit. That's what I did, folks. <laughs> yep. Yeah, listen to Kip. <laughs> okay, cool. I think I think that's it. Now I had two um, questions kind of pop in late time here, and I apologize, Bruce. I know you um, posted yours early, and I forgot about it. Sorry. What I'm gonna do. Bruce and Alex, um, I'm going to offline your uh, email, start an email thread with Kip, and he'll reach out to you directly to answer those two questions. But we are completely and utterly out of time. Um, and I really thank everybody for attending. We had uh, quite a few of you stick it out to the bitter end, and I appreciate that. Um, we are going to have another one of these webinars, um, different guests next month, but we'll have Kip back on of course, shortly. <laughs> Kip's kind of my go-to buddy for, for these webinars. Everybody seems to love them. So um, so we'll see Kip again over the next couple months here, but join us you know, next month as well for webinars. If you're enjoying these, let me know. If you have topics or questions or anything that you'd like to hear from me about, email me, jennifer at sdi.edu. Check out the website, sdi.edu, um, for any additional information on our programs. And again, I thank you guys so much for attending tonight. Oh, one last note. I have, as always, recorded this session. If you would like to view that, I'll go ahead and we're going to get that uploaded to YouTube hopefully tomorrow. And then I will post to the Facebook page uh, a link to the YouTube video. Or you can just check YouTube tomorrow as well. Um, but as soon as that's posted, I will post a link on Facebook. You can click it. It'll take you to YouTube. You'll be able to um, see the recording of this webinar as well. So, I'd like to also and, point, yep, point out to Jennifer that on your past webinars, Jennifer and I have done some really in-depth webinars on starting up your business, your yeah. shop, things like that. Go check that out because a lot of you may find some of these, these answers you're looking for there too. And yeah. we really did a step-by-step -step series at one point. So I just wanted to plug mm -hmm. Jennifer that she does a great job for us. And go check them out. It's well worth your time. Yeah, I, I would agree with that as well. In fact, we've got a um, and even just topics, if you're interested in starting your own business, we do a ton of that in this webinar series. So like Kip said, go check out the web pay or the YouTube account um, for past webinars. And again, we will have this one up hopefully tomorrow. So Kip, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, Jennifer. It's always All a pleasure. Right. Thank you, thank you. And uh, everybody have a great night and keep an eye out for the recording. Thanks all. Good night, everybody. Good night.